actually do this program on or around Valentine's Day because women who are homeless are very close to our hearts. Um, they have unique challenges because they are women. Uh, they're particularly vulnerable to multiple forms of victimization, including extreme mental, sexual, and physical violence. Um, we decided to postpone the event in February because COVID Omicron was peaking and we just didn't think it was safe to gather together. But things are looking much better now. As you saw with the church, the masks are optional. So feel free to wear one or not wear one. And um, we're just really glad that you could be here with us today uh, in person and virtually. I'd um, like to acknowledge that our state senator, Julie Mayfield, is here, and also city council member, um, Kim Roney. So thanks so much for coming. Um, our program today is very compelling. Um, you will learn about the impact of homelessness on mothers and their children and the stigma surrounding that experience. You'll hear from a panel of experts, some with lived experience with homelessness and others whose professions are dedicated to supporting those women and mothers. I'm Eleanor Ashton, Senior Resource Development Director with Homeward Bound. And if you aren't familiar with us, we're a local nonprofit whose mission is preventing and ending homelessness in our community through permanent housing and support. Um, since, thank you, <laughs> since 2006, when we started using the Housing First model, we have moved tw more than 2,300 people into homes and 92% have not returned to homelessness. So I think that's good. Thank you. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who, because of their financial support, we were able to have this event free of charge. Um, I'd like to start with our title sponsor and longtime Homeward Bound supporter, Home Trust Bank, and like to bring up Elise Lewis, Vice President, Senior Business Banking Officer of Home Trust, to say a few words. Come on up, Elise. Good afternoon. I'm Elise Lewis, business banker at Home Trust Bank, and I'm delighted to be here with you today uh, for the Open Your Heart for Women and Homelessness Luncheon. Uh, I began my community banking career in Asheville, where I'm from, about 14 years ago and joined the Home Trust Bank team in 2017. Uh, as the only bank headquartered in Asheville, I was drawn to the bank's commitment to this community that I so dearly love. Um, Home Trust is a proud sponsor of this event, in part because Homeward Bound's mission of preventing and ending homelessness is so well aligned with Home Trust's mission. For over 95 years, our bank has been committed to helping people become homeowners. Um, I have the pleasure of working alongside experts whose passion shows through every day in the work they do. Uh, one of our many talented home loan officers is here today, Christine Dozier, um, along with others from our team, our mortgage team and others. Um, in Christine's 33 years with Home Trust Bank, <laughs> she's made safety and stability a reality for so many and helped families uh, realize their dream of becoming homeowners. Um, the words home and trust are in our name for a reason, because we understand the fundamental need uh, for safety and shelter before other needs can be met. Home really is where the heart is, and Home Trust is committed to making investments in our community. Um, all for individuals, small businesses, and nonprofits like Homeward Bound uh, to thrive. On behalf of all of Home Trust staff, thank you for being here today, and thank you for, for supporting the vital work that Homeward Bound is doing in our community. Thank you, Elise. 
Um, I'd like to thank our other sponsors. Uh, we have Biltmore, we have a table over there. Uh, we have a special relationship with Biltmore because several decades ago, Ms. Mimi Cecil, the Vanderbilt's granddaughter, served as our board chair, and she was a strong advocate for Homeward Bound, helping us navigate the move from managing homelessness to ending homelessness. Also, I'd like to thank Ingalls. They provided this uh, great lunch for free. They've been supporters since the first event we had. And I'd want to thank Wicked Weed Brewing, 98.1 um, The River, who did a wonderful job promoting this event for us. Quility Insurance, Self-Help Credit Union, Pink Dog Creative, Pinecrest Bed and Breakfast, and Nest Realty and Beverly Hanks Realtors, who are leaders in growing our REACH fund. REACH stands for Real Estate Agents Combating Homelessness. And as a result of uh, realtors and allied professionals contributing to that fund, we've um, been able to house 12 people uh, with, with that effort. So if you want to know more about that, please check out our website and click on REACH Fund. So I'm very proud to have the support of these local businesses. In my opening remarks, I always talk about the importance of housing and the cost effectiveness of getting moving people into homes, getting them off the street. Um, WLOS did an investigative piece on the cost of homelessness. So instead of me talking about it, we're going to have uh, show you that piece. Um, Daniel, can you roll the film? Personal crisis leading to drug abuse and homelessness comes at a cost to all of us. A News 13 investigation exposes the cost of leaving the homeless on Buncombe County streets versus the cost of getting them into supportive housing. Tonight, investigative reporter Jennifer Emmert digs into what's driving the costs and what can reduce the impact on everyone. You feel like you're part of the community when you're in a house, or you've got some stable living conditions. Dwight Lassane would know. He just marked a year in his two-bedroom rental. And it's been a joy. A drastic change from the seven years of chaos living on Asheville streets. You go out and you tell people, well, I'm homeless. First thing they say, oh, He's a drunk. He's an alcoholic. Well, uh, you know, but it could be something else. Dwight's struggle goes back decades. There was always a storm in me, and I, and I didn't know how to deal with it. When I was 15, my mother shot and killed my father in front of the whole family, and it, I never dealt with it, you know, through high school, through college. I was very angry, bitter, and I had this attitude with a chip on my shoulder, and I, it carried on into my uh, adult life. You got mixed up, was it alcohol, was it drugs? It was both, you know, and I did it for 40 years. And I would stop for a minute and go back to it because I was never mentally uh, able to say, well, hey, I'm gonna do something different. The fallout, a tidal wave of blows from incarceration to homelessness. You know, I had a drug possession, and it was hard to uh, get housing. Anything that I really needed to help me get up on my feet, my record would come back. You know, it would show up. Not only impacting Dwight, but the community as well. Before I really got into this business as a career, I didn't know. I never thought about the cost to the community. Of Buncombe County's 527 homeless, 230 are considered chronic, meaning they spent more than a year on the streets and are most at risk. The National Alliance to End Homelessness estimates a single homeless individual can cost a community over $35,000 annually. The city of Asheville says that figure is consistent here. It's their contact through crisis services, law enforcement, incarceration, and health care costs that cost taxpayers $18.7 million annually. A lot of that is going to be medical when you're homeless and outside, you don't have a primary care physician. If you don't feel good, you go to the emergency department. We have seen the numbers continue to increase year over year uh, for the last at least five years or so. Um, our volume just continues to go up with patients presenting with mental health needs specifically. While Mission Hospital's behavioral health doesn't track data on homeless served, national averages reveal a single ER visit can amount to $3,700 and escalate to $18,500 with many averaging five trips, cost absorbed by the federal government and the insured. It's a vicious cycle of 
my needs aren't met uh, and I, I get really sick and unstable and I present to the emergency department and I get admitted and I get stabilized and I get medication and then I get discharged and then I'm back out on the street and I don't get my medication and I don't go to my appointments and I get sicker and sicker and sicker. And then I present back to the emergency department again because they can't get off of this uh, carousel that they're on. Homeward Bound's Woodfin Apartments proves how permanent supportive housing makes an impact. A study followed 14 residents who'd been arrested and jailed at the Buncombe County Detention Center a year before receiving housing. Those 14 amassed 121 trips to the detention center. After moving into Woodfin Apartments, detention center trips dropped to 42, a 65.3% decrease. It's a significant amount um, that just offering that level of stability of folks having a place to go, because a lot of those charges folks were picked up on are just typical charges when you don't have a place to go, like trespassing. A similar study by a roof above in Charlotte uncovered a decrease in ER visits as well. And it showed an 81% decrease in the first year of emergency department visits of their residents um, in in the same exact scenario that we're going to be doing here with supportive housing. A lone Homeward Bound's Tunnel Road Motel conversion could be a multi-million dollar impact. When you look at the fact that we'll house 85 people here, that's close to three or four million dollars annually that we, our community won't have to spend on those services for folks. And to operate here a year, it's about one million dollars. While it's a significant impact, it won't eliminate everyone's crisis. For a lot of our folks who are chronically homeless, it might take one or two placements even before we find the fit. Whether that's a home supportive apartment complex or converted hotel like the Days Inn and Ramada Inn projects. And then we figured out a plan to give me permanent housing, which worked out real well for me. It's put Dwight on a path that's kept him out of the detention center. You know, you never really care till you know someone else cares. And we had a lot of people that cared there. And it was a process of where I want to go next. Giving Dwight a future forecast full of possibilities. But the community got to chime in, too. We got to help our weakest link. In Asheville. That's what it's all about, helping each other. Jennifer Emmert. You know what I'm saying? We're better together. News 13. We are better together. And you can find a further breakdown. Thanks. As Dwight said, we are better together. Homelessness is a community issue, and it takes a community effort to end it. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about what you can do to help uh, later. So to give you some context on today's topic of mothers and their children experiencing homelessness, there are more families who are homeless in the United States than any other industrialized country. Nearly 172,000 people and families experienced homelessness in 2020, making up 30% of the unhoused population. 90% of the homeless families are led by a young mother without any financial or emotional support. As I mentioned before, mothers experience high rates of violence, exploitation, and victimization. Women and children represent the fastest growing groups of homeless population in the United States with domestic violence being the largest contributing factor. Many women find themselves trapped in homelessness because of the high high affordable housing. We know that's true in Asheville. Other contributing factors include complexity of navigating subsidized housing applications, difficulty in finding health care for themselves and their kids, or trying to navigate the court system trying to get child support. These things can be overwhelming for anybody, but especially overwhelming for mothers who are homeless, makes them feel helpless and demoralized when they are continuously rejected for the search for supports. For many women experiencing homelessness, peer support from another woman who has been through what she has is the most important source of help, and we will hear about that later today. For lots of homeless mothers, resiliency and hope come directly from their identity as mothers and their need to work toward a better situation for their children. Their kids are their motivation to move forward despite unimaginable barriers. Every woman who has battled homelessness 
has a different story to tell. Some remain stuck in the system and others overcome adversity and become advocates for their own community. You're gonna see a short film about a woman who has done just that. Chris is a program manager at A Hope, run by Homeward Bound. In her past, she made some choices that resulted in her having to separate from her child for a while. She spent some years living on the streets and a period of time incarcerated. Then she turned it all around and now is using her life experience to help others. After the film, the panel of experts will introduce themselves and discuss how the film relates to their professional and personal experience with mothers who are homeless. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers from our audience, our live audience and our virtual audience. Daniel, will you roll Chris's film? So my experience in, with homelessness probably wasn't like everyone else's. I stayed doubled up for a while, but you burn those bridges quickly if you're busy trying to meet your own needs and addictions, right? So then after I had stayed with everyone I could, I then slept in my car and I didn't know about resources and I didn't know about how to get the things I needed. So there was a lot of time spent just spinning my wheels and probably didn't really care what I needed at that point because I was so busy getting other needs met. So I slept in my car. And then I was sentenced to prison. So I went to prison, which was now my home. So I think during that time, I don't think my daughter actually got that she was never going to come back with me after DSS got involved. Because I think she always thought I was coming back, which I did come back, but I was, I don't think she understood I was getting prison time. I don't think that was ever an understanding for her. Being separated from my child was probably the most agonizing thing you could ever deal with as a parent. Being a parent and not being allowed to see your child is um, excruciating. And especially if it's by your own hand, I think that's even different because you made the choice to not have your kid anymore because you made a choice to do something that wasn't okay. So in that, you have to learn to reframe things. But it showed me that I, I really need to take accountability for my own actions. And so the reason why she wasn't with me was, was my fault. It takes you a while to get there, especially when you're going through it, you want to blame everyone else. But those choices I made were my choices. And she was an innocent bystander and she didn't ask for that. So my daughter and I didn't talk till probably I was in prison, probably seven, eight months because she wasn't allowed to. And I understood that. So, but we did start talking while I was in prison. She was very supportive at a young age, but I think I, early on in that relationship that we restarted while I was in prison, I think I really wanted her to know she wasn't responsible for me anymore, that she didn't have to take care of me and she didn't have to be the parent anymore. And I think that took her so long to unlearn. She's still, if I don't answer my phone right when she calls, she's like, where are you at? What are you doing? You know? But I think she was so used to that role for so long that it just took so long to unlearn it. You know, things we we uh, subject our children to that those things last a lifetime. Some days are good and some days are bad. And for the most part, I'm so fortunate in the sense that she still loves me and she still talks to me and includes me in her life and in whatever way she can include me in her life, that I am blessed beyond. Because anyone else who told my story would probably be like, I can't believe your kid even talks to you. 
you know, we were, I was raised very religious and when you're raised that way and there's no other way to discuss things, all you do is pray about it. That's not a negative thing. I don't mean that negatively, but kids need other tools. Kids need their parents to be able to sit down with them and, and talk with them about what's hurting them. When you're not allowed to speak about the pain you have and you have to figure out some other way to deal with that pain, you are more apt to make the wrong choice because you've never been given the tools to process your pain correctly. Best thing that ever happened to me, hands down, is prison because that is where I grew up. That is where I learned to take accountability for myself. It gave me what I needed. When I needed it, even though I didn't think I needed it, um, I learned a lot in prison. I learned tons about cooking, cleaning. Um, I did a program where you learned how to balance a checkbook and how to learn to do daily activities, which you don't think are important. I got life skills and prison isn't easy. And if you choose not to do anything, you could lay around there for five years. But if you want to do better, you can be proactive and do better. You just have to want it. My life is peaceful now. My life is, um, it's not exciting. I like it that way. I think my life is uh, full of meaningful moments. It's, it's more precious now, I can honestly say that. My life is way more precious and I value it. And I think that's what we lack when we're struggling with uh, substance use. We, we lack value. We don't feel like a whole person and we're looking to feel that. I thought about hope last night because I came across um, this thing I used to say in prison. Emily Dickinson uh, has a poem that's called Hope. I don't even know if it's called Hope. It's just Emily Dickinson. Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in your soul sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Hi, my name is Alana Kinsella, and I am the Permanent Supportive Housing Assistant Director. You'll have to excuse me, I just got my new title. <laughs> um, I have been with Homer Bound since 2012. I started as an intern um, and then turned into a volunteer, and in 2013, I became a full employee, full time employee. I started my um, journey on ending homelessness at A Hope, and since then I have transitioned into permanent supportive housing, providing support at the Woodfit Apartments. Um, this video gets me not only because Chris is my coworker, but because at the beginning when I started working with the homeless population, it was dominantly males. Um, and through the years of almost nine years now, I've seen, seen an increase um, of women and families coming through and acknowledging how hard that is to ask for support and to know the fear of potentials of losing your children or being put into a system that you've worked so hard to not go into um, leaves families more obligated to not reach out for assistance. And so when I hear the story of her jumping from couch to couch until finally there were no more couches and then finally she's sleeping in, a, in her car, that's a very familiar story that those of us who work with individuals in homelessness hear. That it starts out staying with family and then it turns into a space that you can't take back. Homeless charges, um, when people are experiencing homelessness, the criminal charges that they end up facing are things that you and I would never receive charges for, for doing in our own home. Those things could be sleeping in the wrong place, needing to use a bathroom when there's no public access. Um, it, it can go on and on. And so I just 
to me, the, the story of Chris is us bringing women together to empower one another to say we're here and we can do this as a community together. Hi, I'm Sonny Morgan. I am the um, intake case manager at Homer Bay at AHO. Uh, Chris is my best friend. She was also my uh, peer support. Alana was my best support at AHO. I was a client four years ago. Um, I was on the street for three years here in Asheville, but I had, just like Chris, I had couch hopped and stayed with family and burned every bridge that um, I crossed. And um, ended up here in Asheville and I couldn't have ended up in a better place with better people. Um, but it, it's, Chris's story is all too familiar. Uh, the drugs, the, uh, the late relationship with uh, the children and the neglect that um, we sometimes do um, when our family is involved. You always hurt the ones you love the most. And this is my daughter. <laughs> She's uh, here to give her side of it too. Um, yeah, I, I'm really grateful to be able to um, be giving back to my community right now, working at A-Hope. Um, and um, a lot of those people are the best people I've ever met in my life. They just have bad bad situations, things that, that were out of their control, that they weren't able to uh, um, get themselves out of homelessness. And that's what I'm here for. I wanna help get them out of homelessness, just like my friends helped me. My name is Jessica Bain, and I am a peer support and Hope Rising Coordinator for Hope Coalition in Hendersonville. And um, I'm here, I'm Sonia's daughter. And I think one thing that we miss about homelessness is that it can leave a generational impact. <laughs> I'm okay. Two, and my kids were taken. So three generations were in. This hits home with us really bad. Um, my, I lost one of my twins to her father. Um, and uh, Jessica lost uh, her children. Um, and um, it was hard on all of us, it really was. But um, she's made it through and uh, the kids are better off now. Um, and she has really done her part to give back to the community. Um, not only is she a peer support specialist, she is also a uh, CDAC, Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor. So she's given back more than she knows. My name is Tammy Cody, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker uh, with a program called Project Kara. And we're embedded in the high-risk OB clinic at Mayhack. Um, Project CARA stands for uh, care that respects, that advocates respects, resiliency, and recovery for all. Uh, we are a treatment program providing uh, OB care for women with substance use disorders uh, during their pregnancy and one year postpartum. We provide complex care management. We have licensed clinical addiction specialists. We try to provide behavioral health support. Um, everything that my partners down the line have spoken of are the women that we serve. Um, we are seeing uh, a much higher incidence of homeless uh, women experiencing homelessness, uh, living in their cars, trying to support their families, trying to keep their families together. Um, and certainly the fear that comes with that, um, you know, it's, 
it's hard to ask for help when you're afraid of what the results might be. Um, so it really is a double-edged sword. Um, AHOPE is some, a lot of our patients, it is a lifeline for them. Um, and just the little things, being, being able to get your mail, being able to take a shower, um, the things that we take for granted. I, I know in my experience, uh, a woman explained to me that the last thing you ever wanted to lose was your car. And I was like, I, well, I really never thought about it like that. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity of working with Chris. She was supporting one of the, the families that we work with. And, and it was amazing. Again, it, it was a lifeline um, from just support and that peer who had walked where this mom was, was experiencing now. Um, I don't have much to add. I, I think uh, the average age of first use for the women that are in our program is 13. And that is often introduced by a first degree relative. So as you said, it's a, a generational pattern that uh, working together as a community, I, I do feel like we can support each other and make a difference in this. So. Thank you. Now we're gonna open it up to questions and answers. So Daniel, do I use a different mic or should I use this one? Okay. So does anybody have any questions for our panel? First of all, thank you so much for everything you have all done. You've just really reached our hearts very much. I'm curious to know how the first step happens. Do they come to you? Do they, do they come off the, to the streets? Can they find you? What are the steps from sleeping on the sidewalk and needing a lot of help to getting to the point where they do have their own home? So AHOPE Day Center, um, when you're experiencing homelessness, a lot of times people are finding out by word of mouth from other clients. Um, so a client might find somebody sleeping in their car and say, hey, I know where we can get you a cup of coffee. I know where we can get you a shower. And that's where it starts. And so when they walk into our doors, um, we take some basic demographic information and explain what kind of services we're providing at A Hope. Um, and then um, about two weeks after we sit down and we do an intake, that's the starting process. And so we have a variety of different programs that individuals may qualify for. Um, and they range everywhere from rapid rehousing, which is kind of a step up and a one-time assistance and can be a prevention um, to prevent homelessness from starting. Um, and then we have permanent supportive housing um, and a more intensive, all-inclusive program, which is the Woodfin. So we really try to work with individuals to find out what's the best solution. The number one thing that we try to do at AHOPE is to build community. So we want to get people talking to other community partners. We want to develop some resources. We want to help them get food stamps, their ID, um, anything we can to make this a little bit easier. We try to connect them with shelters. Um, one thing, especially for women experiencing homelessness, is, is a shelter can be extremely intimidating. Um, it's something that we can all respect that we try to keep our, our family business private. And when you're living in a shelter, your business is everybody's business. So it can be really hard. So we'd be mindful about that. And what's great about AHOPE is, is that there isn't this requirement that you're in shelter. So the fact that we believe in housing first means we take you where you are and we work with that. Um, so we're not going to make any requirements that you be in a shelter for so many nights before we work with you. Our requirement is, is that you're homeless. Does that help? I have a quick question for you for Transformation Village, which is very well known for women and, you know, I think children as well. Um, tell me your difference between you guys and what you do as far as home first as to I think they do more. Uh, explain the difference between the two. I'm not real familiar with um, Transformation Village. I believe that it's um, homes. It's like 
it's transitional homes. Um, the difference would be from what we do, I would say we, um, I, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I think the transformation village is essentially a transition home that the women and kids can go to. It's not their permanent home. Whereas Homer Bound is going to get you into your home where you're going to be able to stay stably housed, whereas Transformation Village is essentially this is your transition period until we get you in a home. Okay, that's the important part I was trying to get you guys yeah. to say. Very good. The other piece of it is, is that um, a lot of programs are what we call housing readiness. So, so there's two separate programs. We have housing readiness, and then we have housing first. So housing readiness means that you've completed these steps and you've been working on these things to get into permanent supportive housing. Homeware Bound doesn't do transitional housing because we feel that the biggest and the most important thing we can do is give you four walls, a roof, and a door that locks. Um, once we start there, then we've given you some security and we can start on all the other things. That's the key is we're, we're just saying right where you are, exactly how you are. And we're not asking you to get sober, have a job, anything. We're saying, wow, homelessness is big. It's hard. Let's get you a safe place first. I, I agree. Um, both of them are very important, but I wanted you guys to be able to tell what you guys do. Twofold, sorry. You guys mentioned the Ramada Inn in your, how are you guys working with the Ramada Inn as it transfers into um, housing? Um, so the Ramada Inn, we are working with different partners through there um, to try to get housing for individuals. Um, so th those individuals are being slated um, with the city partners that's running the Ramada Inn. So we're not running the Ramada Inn, um, but we do take on some of those clients that are being slated for housing. So it depends on what programs are going into. Um, it could be the housing choice voucher. It could be permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing. They are building individual plans and then Homeward Bound is included in some of those plans. Hi, thank you all. Um, I used to volunteer at the Room at the Inn program in our church. And I know with COVID, um, I'm assuming all churches, but at least our church I know has uh, stopped doing that and they haven't taken it back up. And I wanted to know, um, we had wonderful training through AHOPE on um, you know, how, how to help people. Uh, I wondered if you could address that, if that's gonna be coming back around or if it already is. And then a second question, I just was curious because you're looking at uh, long-term housing, are you partnering at all with um, Habitat? I'll answer the first one. Um, I was in the RIDI program. I was uh, part of that program. At this time, I don't think that um, they have plans to uh, start that again. I wish they would. I would really like to get in on that. The churches were wonderful to us. They uh, spoiled us rotten. Um, for those of you who don't know about the RIDI program, the RIDI program is um, 12 women um, with an extra bed, an emergency bed. Church, a different church each week would sponsor us. They would feed us three meals a day. They would stay up all night and make sure we were safe while we slept, um, give us rides to and from uh, AHOPE. Uh, we were, some of the churches we were able to shower, we were here a couple of times. Um, it's a great program, and we really got to uh, got to learn about community support through the Rudy program. It, it was a wonderful thing. I wish we could bring that back. I remember when you were in that program, and I, I had I had gotten my own house at this point, but I remember you telling me about um, how amazing it was and how much stuff that um, they provided for you guys, and like. I was talking to you on the phone one day and you were getting a foot massage. Yeah. And I was like, her life is better than mine at this point. <laughs> yeah, they were, the churches were wonderful to us yeah. and it was a great program. There are some faith communities that are talking about starting that that's program awesome. up and that's really where it belongs. Yes. So that's exciting. I'd love to be involved yeah. in that. <laughs> I would add to that. that. That was truly a lifeline, uh, another lifeline for a lot of the women that we work with that, when every other shelter was full, when it just was a place that you knew you could be safe and, and have a plan for tomorrow night. Um, I think that was a huge part of it. 
The second part of that question was in regards to Habitat for Humanity. Um, so what we try to do when we're working with folks in supportive housing is to build a long-term graduation plan. So we're always trying to help clients not have us in their support system and to get community built. So that could be something that is at the end of somebody's plan, um, but it, it's not typically something that we jump right into because when you're thinking about somebody coming out of homelessness, are they going to have, are they going to meet the income criteria? Are they going to have all the documentation that they need in order to apply for that loan? How do they keep up with all of the paperwork and those types of things? So when we think about Habitat, that's going to be a next step. That's going to be one of those pieces of like celebration. Um, you're not going to be seeing your housing case manager anymore, but these are your permanent keys. Um, we haven't had too many clients that go that way because most of them just don't have have that large of a, a, an outlook goal right now they're they're working out what they're working on and um, we have been really working with the housing choice voucher program in Asheville um, so when people are no longer with Homeward Bound and they don't need as much support from us, we're graduating them to this program that also provides the financial support for them to maintain affordable housing. Right now, that's like a really big push is that affordable housing. So the housing choice voucher helps individuals by they only pay 30% of their income, which is what the federal government has said is affordable. If you go over that 30%, you are starting to put your toe into that at-risk population of becoming homelessness. So we really try to make sure people are set up for success in affordable housing. For those of you who experienced homelessness, what kind of intervention would have would have helped you, your life, take a different path? And at what point in your journey would that have been helpful for you? I think just having support would have been helpful. You know, you've burned your bridges. Nobody's helping you. No, no family's talking to you. Um, I was homeless during pregnancy and that was, that was awful. I gave birth in jail. Um, better than the street, but um, I think just support. Yes, I'll agree with that. Um, I didn't even know what community was until I came to Asheville and got in with A Hope and the Ready program and never had much family support. Um, but with my drug abuse, um, my brothers and sisters all disowned me, wouldn't have anything to do with me. Um, and rightfully so in some situations. I was an embarrassment, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> but yeah, support is definitely what you need. Just any support. I am curious about um, the mental health support that is out there for people who are coming in, because whether it's trauma, uh, living on the streets creates trauma, um, or it is a diagnosed mental health condition, what, how do you get support? Is it through Medicaid or is it through programs in the community? I'm curious about that. We have Mayhek that comes uh, every Thursday. Um, they, to a hope and they set up and they have support uh, sunrise comes as well with their peer support. And we have a, um, a doctor that comes on Thursdays who's really helped mental illness is one of the biggest leading causes of homelessness. And um, there's not really enough support around that. In my opinion, uh, we, we do everything we can to help. Um, Pastor Mark Siler is a, a wonderful counselor and, um, the doctor that comes from Mayhek has, has uh, made a, a, an impact on some of the folks. It's really hard to get a lot of people to engage, though, especially if they're mentally ill. They, they, it's really hard to get them to engage. Sure. Again, I agree with everything that you've said. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. It's, there's so many challenges. Um, you know, there are insurance challenges, transportation challenges, childcare 
Um, certainly we're trying to make it as available as possible in as many different forms. Um, one of the silver linings of COVID, we've been able to do telehealth, uh, which we were not previously able to do. But, but small steps like that of being able to say, if you live an hour and a half away, you don't have to go through the first three hurdles to get there to get to an appointment that we can provide support to you through telehealth. Um, working with regional communities, this, the peer support programs are just absolutely phenomenal to meet people where they are, uh, literally and figuratively, and then make the connections to, to get them step by step to what, what they're ready for. Um, support looks a very different depending on where you are and, and who you are, and it might be on the street, it might be in the park, um, but that, that piece of engagement of, of treating people so that they would come back and seek support or answer your call, um, I, to me it's community development and, and creating a safe place for engagement. For um, the Woodfin Apartments and permanent supportive housing, we try to make individual plans. Um, so we are really about respecting where an individual is. Um, but I think that when it comes to mental health, one thing to keep in mind is, is that us as a community can help remove these stigmas that mental health, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't need a counselor, I'm not crazy. We don't, we're not all crazy, um, but it really does well for us to have another ear to talk to or to discharge some of these feelings. Um, we know that substance use is a coping skill. And so the more that we encourage people and we open the dialogue um, and encourage the dialogue, the more support we're providing to people. And it's another step towards them obtaining even more assistance. I don't know where to begin. <clears throat> Homeward Bound um, provides so much information and help for all of you who are not involved with Homeward Bound. Getting involved changes you as well. I worked with Room in the Inn for eight years, and I loved by giving the support to the ladies that we dealt with. It not only encouraged them to succeed, but being a participant just it made me want to, to help more. It's so easy for people to judge others. I see it and hear it all the time. And yet we're all this close to being out there. <laughs> I hope that Room in the End comes back because it was a fabulous program and the people that you met in all the different churches and things were created their own programs to help these ladies succeed. If you're not involved, get involved any way you can. Thank you. Thank you. Bellamy, do we have any questions virtual or from the virtual audience? We do. We have a question from Pat Hillman Shields. He wants to know how Homeward Bound's programs coordinate with local domestic violence programs like Helpmate. So again, each plan is individualized, um, but what we know about, especially domestic violence um, and um, sexual violence is that we need to bring in the professionals. So we work really close um, with our clients to develop individualized safety plans. Um, and again, being that bridge for a resource. So um, it can be really intimidating to walk in and tell somebody your story that maybe you're not so proud that you've been involved in. Um, but having somebody else sitting there with you um, makes telling that story a little easier. And it's somebody to kind of give you that encouragement. Um, so I kind of when I talk about Homer Bound, especially with clients, I talk about us being a bridge. Um, we're here to help people 
meet new resources and plan with those resources. Um, we're kind of like in the shadows after that. So once help me gets involved, we, we step back and support that individualized plan that they're working with that agency. Um, so there's several agencies, um, help me our voice. And then we also have been coordinating with Hendersonville as well. Um, so I think that that's the big thing is it's really individualized. Um, and we just try to support and bridge as much as we can. Thank you for this really amazing eye-opening opportunity. I was really struck with how um, Chris um, took responsibility and was willing to do the work. And I'm just wondering, is that typical? Are people taking responsibility, willing to do the work, or does it take years and years for them to get to the point where Chris was? Like, how long did it did it take for you guys to realize I really need to get help and then actually get help? There are barriers. I, it, it was years for me. Um, I started using when I was 17, I think it was. So it was years. Um, and it took a lot. It, it took many, many years. It took several abusive relationships, um, uh, marriages. Um, it took me making up my mind and just saying I've had enough and I, I want better for me. And um, I think when that happens, that's when you first start to heal. And as you do the work, you, you heal more. And, but yeah, that it would took a long time. It took a lot of instances, a lot of, lots of stuff. When you first become homeless, you don't know the resources that are out there because you've never had to use them, right? So you don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. You don't know who to talk to. Um, and um, part of what I did during my um, becoming a peer support was I went out and found every resource that I could possibly find because one of my biggest barriers was not knowing the help that was out there. So in permanent supportive housing, we often um, see changes start to happen right away. Um, once you give somebody security, um, there is a different space that can happen. Um, moving people from homelessness into housing, I don't know how many years I've done it now, a few. Um, I, I always think of one story that reminds me of what what the struggle really is and what being stuck in that crisis mode is. Um, we had a gentleman who I had been working with for months to get him an actual home. We finally got him home this whole time, three months. I'm like, man, you're, you're walking funny. You're walking funny. You're walking funny. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. About a week after we got him into housing, gave him his own keys, I finally showed up and I said, oh, no, you're really walking funny. And he said, yeah, something's wrong with my foot. Um, got him to the doctor and that foot had been broken for four months. Um, but because of his, of his determination and his need to survive, that foot, that pain that he was having on that foot was not the top priority. His top priority was safety and security. And he was doing everything he could do to find that on the streets. And that foot was not going to be resolved. So once we got him into housing and, you know, a week after we find out this foot's been broken for all this time, but he was able to do the rehab he needed. And you would never know that he had walked around with a broken foot for as long. Um, but it, it was that moment of like, wow, when people don't have a home and they don't have a safe space, their prime objective is survival. And so you're more likely to do things that you wouldn't do any other time. And so, you know, I, I, I always tell people like we all have a, um, a, a crisis response, right? Like some people fight, flight, flee, flee you know, um, and that is constantly activated when a person is experiencing homelessness. And so it's important for us to remember that the things that they are doing or, or how they're going may not have logic to us, but to them, it's about survival. Oh. 
Um, so I was, I'm so glad that you brought up that issue with the um, broken bones, because I think when we see our neighbors hurting in that way, like if you see someone with a broken foot or a broken arm, you say, well, how long will you have this cast on? What can I do to help? But when we have that broken heart or a broken brain, what can we do with our time and our talent and our treasure to be that support? How can we address the stigma? Can you share with us in the room some resources for how we can in our faith communities and in our neighborhoods um, really be that support in a genuine way? I think just showing up for people, um, you know, uh, me and Sunny kind of joke all the time <laughs> about um, our path. Um, and I actually just found, uh, I left a hope in 2018 and went back to the Woodfin and Sunny had printed off this thing. And then there it said, one day I'm going to be your coworker. Um, here she is. We have to see people. We have to see people for where they are and understand that we're not going to change them, but we can be a support. Um, learning to talk about how hard things are um, is a reality and something that we can all relate to. Um, and it's one thing that I think we're also afraid to be vulnerable and say, man, I hurt too sometimes. Um, but doing permanent supportive housing, one of the big things that, you know, any client who's ever worked with you would tell you is, is like, Alana's going to be the person who's saying, we can't leave all this stuff in our head. And the more people we talk to and the more safe spaces we have, the faster we process it. So what I really encourage people to do is to see people for humans and not what they could be, but just acknowledge their space where they are. Um, it's, it's amazing how much, uh, hi, how are you doing? I see you friend, um, how far that goes. Um, I kind of laugh all the time because I've done this work for so long. So I tell people that I'm one of the most protected people in Asheville, um, because, I, I just connect. Um, I see people for what they are. I know that there are times when their mental health isn't the best, um, but that's, that's the reality. Um, and they don't get to a person who's experiencing homelessness and experiencing a mental health crisis doesn't get to do it at home in their bathroom. I have that luxury. And so I respect that man, if, if somebody saw me on my bad day on the, on the Sundays or the Saturdays that I don't go out of my house, I think about that. What, what, what would that look like? And would I get arrested? Would the police show up? The fire department, you know, like, and, and so I respect that. And I, I give that person space. And, and sometimes it's just that I see you, I hear you, and we're here for each other. Um, I used to say, please remove judgment, but I just did a training the other day that said, uh, we all make judgments and I made a lot of them before I put this outfit on to come here. So, um, I think let's not make assumptions. Um, let's see humans for what they are and just say hi to one another. Um, it's, it's the start of building community. Um, COVID put a lot of di divisions for people and it was really hard. We saw that in the homeless community, especially, um, a lot of us got that safety and protection to be able to um, isolate and stay home. Our, our neighbors on the streets didn't. Um, it was also a very, very, very alone time for them. Um, and now as we're all coming back to the streets, we see them, um, but we forget that we had that year and a half in our house and they've had that year and a half on the street. So it's, it's just being mindful of that. I get it. I want to take one more virtual question. Is there one, Bellamy? Okay, good. And um, we'll take one or two more. Um, you want to get that one? Yes, I want to comment, kind of follow up with the lady that spoke a while ago about, hey, Chris, I mean, uh, son. <laughs> um, I do a little volunteering over at A-Hope. A and uh, I, Julie and I moved from Nashville, Tennessee over here. And I work with Room and Inn program over there as a volunteer in Nashville for about six or seven years. I want to speak to A-Hope particularly the folks that come to a hope, it is some serious homeless situations compared to Nashville. It's minor league and major league. If you use a baseball analogy, it is some serious folks coming in there. Okay. 
I know there's been some bad rap on TV, whatever. <laughs> the Days In facility is going to be addressing that issue. So be aware of that. It's, it's coming up. So let's get behind that thing because that is what can help folks that are coming there. But, uh, yeah, it's just wanted a perspective on things that yeah. y'all are doing yeoman's work over there. Let me <laughs> just you. say that. Um, yeah, Thank you. It's, it's on the bad press. Um, it's just a handful of folks. Uh, and I'm sure you and Julie have both seen it. Um, everybody has a bad day, but there are a handful of folks who have severe mental illness and they're just hard to support very hard to support, uh, to connect with, or to get them connected. Um, but we're doing our best. We're doing our best to try and help every single person that comes through the door. And we have great volunteers like Julie and Frank. Jack cleans a hope every Wednesday <laughs> from head to head to top. So he's a great volunteer and his wife, Julie as well. Yeah, we couldn't function without our volunteers. So those of you that are here, there are volunteers. Thank you so much. Yes. How do we find out um, ways to help volunteer wise? That would be Ms. Well, Cabo. Cabo. Yeah, our volunteer specialist <laughs> is here today. Cabo Nina Beresford. <laughs> Homeward Bound, I would be more than happy to talk to you after we're done here um, and exchange contact information. So yeah, uh, it's great seeing all of you here and I love hearing from staff members and uh, extensions, how, how much of an impact what we're doing really matters. And as a collective, I think it's beautiful. So yeah, if you'd love to get involved, feel free to grab me. Great. Thanks. All right, thank you. Hey, I want to thank you all for those great questions and thank our panel for the thought-provoking answers. And I know that it's difficult to talk about these sensitive issues and uh, you've been very vulnerable and we all appreciate it. Let's give them a hand. Thanks. I just, I just wanted to say that uh, as we all sit here and listen to the amazing stories, I think uh, sometimes we don't relate personally as much to what they're talking about as, as I think we can. All of us out here in the crowd, we all face challenges in our lives. We all see things in us that we would like to be different, uh, different choices. It takes a lot of courage to change, do things different, care more. And uh, so I think all of us here are inspired in our own personal lives to do better the way you all have. And just want to acknowledge that we're, you know, we're all on the same page and you have inspired all of us today by your courage and your choices. Thank you. Well, I know when I go to events like this, I want to hear how I can help. So I'm going to leave you with some action steps where you can help. Please advocate for affordable housing. We need more affordable housing. You all know this in Asheville and Buncombe County. This is one of the biggest impediments to being able to house individuals and families who are, who are unhoused. And it's also a major cause of homelessness. So any chance you get, please advocate for affordable housing. As Jack said, please, um, we appreciate the support for our hotel conversion project. We're calling it Home is Key. Home is key to health, safety, healing, and hope. And without a home, none of those things are possible. Um, 
that project um, will be a home for 85 of our most chronically homeless individuals. A lot of the folks that you're seeing downtown or you're seeing on Tunnel Road, they've been living on the streets for decades. We are going to move them into homes. They are going to have support services right on site, including case management, mental and behavioral health services, social and educational activities, job training, and a medical clinic. And it will reduce chronic homelessness in our community by roughly 40%. So please help us out with that. Thank you. Second, please donate your gently used furnishings to our Welcome Home Donation Center. It's in Woodfin. Um, we use these community donations to move homeward bound clients into homes. One of the reasons we have a 92% success rate in keeping them there is because we give them a furnished apartment. So that's something that you can do for us. We also are helping uh, Catholic charities uh, help the refuge, uh, refugee families from Afghanistan move into housing. And last but not least, we have a group of dedicated women who are passionate about improving the lives of women who are struggling with the trauma of homelessness. They have created a gift match of $8,000. I want to thank Nancy Marr, Barbara Love, Millie Elmore, Carrie Johnson, Julie Lunn, Kelly Pierce, Hetty Fisher, Neely New, and Leah Broker. These funds will go to AHOPE and to serve women who are struggling with homelessness that come to AHOPE. When you walk in there, as many of the folks have said today, it's the first step toward housing. You also can get a cup of coffee, a warm pair of socks, a hot shower, you can check your mail and get in from the cold. It's also a safe haven for women who are homeless. Also, a portion is going to go to upgrading one of the apartments at Key Commons, which is Homeward Bound's permanent supportive housing complex that we bought a couple of years ago. These upgrades will, um, are for a gentleman and his aunt who live there and will make life easier for the aunt. So if you're interested in donating, can we put the number up there uh, to reach our $8,000 gift match, please text the word HOME to this number. We've got it up there, 888 403 for 489, or you can take a picture of the QR code that's on the back of your program. We're going to extend these donations until Friday, um, but they will all go toward the match. Now for one final video, uh, we live streamed this last year, the very talented Joe Lasher and Caitlin Baker. Uh, Joe is from Weaverville and he wrote this song for this event last year. And it's so beautiful, we wanted you to hear it. So can you play the music video? Hey y'all, I'm Joe Lasher. And I'm Caitlin Baker. We're excited to team up with Homeward Bound to help make a difference and raise awareness to end homelessness. We put our heads and our hearts together to bring you guys this song, and we hope it encourages you to make an impact. You can make your donations at www.homewardboundwnc.org slash donations. Without further ado, here's our song. It's called Along, Along the Way. way. <laughs> Gave him everything she could, yeah, cause he made her feel like ten feet tall. And never thought he would let her fall, but time goes on and uncovers ugly truth. In the mirror in her eyes she sees abuse. In a cry to get back on her feet, she walked down on the lonely street, but every broken road. Cause at the end it's where you learn to live again In the darkness you can always find a light Where you can take the wrong and you can make it right There's another road, choose a different path Find a helping hand that gets you off your back Stay strong, keep on, cause there'll be better days And you'll find yourself Yes, 
started to test his patience So he settled for self-medication And found himself cold under the city lights With nowhere to lay his head to sleep at night He holds a sign that says freedom may free Cause it cost him everything again for coming. We appreciate your time and your energy and your commitment to ending homelessness in our community. I'd like to again thank the sponsors, Home Trust Bank, Biltmore, Wicked Weed, Beverly Hanks, Nest Realty, 98.1, The River, Quillity, Pink Dog Galleries, Self-Help Credit Union, Pinecrest Bed and Breakfast. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes? Through this last year, I got a little more involved here, and I own a shopping center, and in my shopping center, sometimes we have people that will sleep in their cars, so if you guys could do me a really solid, this is something that I was provided just recently, is a list of resources to give to individuals like herself that did not know where to go. I had a young woman with a brand new infant baby living in my parking lot, it gets me very emotional. And I handed her a list of resources and next to her was a husband or individual that was drinking beer that threw the beer cans out the window. I simply mentioned to her, these are the resources you can go to. Afterwards, she thanked me. Good job. Yes, and that's the kind of help we need. Thank you.